So they had the planes, they had the technology, they had the tactics, but it didn't work. Yeah, sounds once again like the Germans, oof, that's bright. Uh, the Germans tried to wonder waffle themselves out of a problem once again. But really, I think it's more than that. All right, is that set up? Perfect, let's go. All right, that's like a AA searchlight right here. Where do I put this now? This video is produced in corporations with Mortons and AK Interactive. Welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am Chris and in this video I will talk about why Germany shifted to jets, why it started a decentralized production of jet fighters, and what making the ME262s on a production line, a decentralized production line, meant in practice, and what the final figures tell us about the success or failure of ME262 production. Germany decided to introduce jet aircraft into the Luftwaffe in 1944. Although the development goes back to various designs, and that includes the ME262 into the 1930s. There were various reasons for this from the tactical to the strategic level. For example, Germany had promised building enough planes and piston engines, which were very resource intensive. And when they did build them through a new production program, the lack of fuel and pilots was negatively impacting Luftwaffe operations. Operationally and strategically speaking, however, Allied air superiority, especially in the West, placed severe pressures on German industry, infrastructure, and the ability to move supplies and units. The main goal was therefore to re-establish the Luftwaffe to fighting strength, stop daytime bombing raids, and reset the air war, which would then afford a renewed operational freedom for the Luftwaffe and the German army, the Heer. Thus, the jet fighter and the ME262 in particular were seen as a way to balance out the numerical inferiority with technological and tactical superiority. And to do this, Germany then essentially went to what we nowadays would call a high-low mix for jet fighters, specifically putting forward both the ME262 and the Heinkel 162. You can watch my video comparing these two aircraft here. And as I'm already on the case of linking my videos, I'll just bite the awkward self-promotion bullet by saying that now is of course that perfect time to engage in good old YouTube content creator bingo. So like, subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any future video. And if you like this video and my archive research, you can of course also support via Patreon or channel memberships. It's completely up to you, but any and all of these things really do help. The exact delimitation between a centralized and a decentralized production line is really murky once you think about it, but broadly defined, we can say that the more steps of the production are completed outside a central hub where the final assembly takes place, the more decentralized it is. The aim of the decentralized production is to decrease the value of each production site as a high value target to make an attack on each both improbable from a cost-benefit standpoint, as well as to limit the effect this attack has on the overall production line. However, you are buying this at a cost of having to build up a complex logistic infrastructure, and you have increasing complexity for housing and the storing of men and material, as well as usually many more man hours for production as well. The ME262 production was never planned to be decentralized. However, the bomber threat and the raids against Messerschmitt plants in 1943 required this change. Most of the industry was relocated to the countryside in the south of Germany, between Munich and Stuttgart, conveniently linked around the main highway that was running between these two regional capitals. This was close enough to the initial production facilities to be easy to manage, and then we would also prepare for the production to transition to special centralized underground factories that were built around this time. Construction of these works started in 1944, though they were never fully completed. Let's have a closer look at the production line as far as we can reconstruct it. The final assembly was first at Leipheim and a forest workshop known as Kuno 1 that was nearby, but also at Kuno 2 near Burgau and then at Swabisch Hall, Obertraubling and Neuburg. From there, a large network of smaller and medium-sized workshops and stockpiles fed into the construction of the ME262. For example, a highway tunnel at Leonberg near Stuttgart was used for the final assembly of the wings, Oberzell and Hagelstadt built the fuselage, and Günzburg manufactured a nose cone, while the engine cowlings and the control surfaces 
were coming from Lauingen and Wasserburg. The Jumo 004 engines were then mainly built at the Nordwerk Mittelwerk tunnel factory near Nordhausen and at Muldenstein. This was at 350, well roughly 350 kilometers from the main 262 production area because it, that is also the original area where Junkers, who of course designed the Jumo engines, had resided next to Dessau. Then the completed aircraft were flown off from nearby airfields or the Autobahn, often at Autobahn kilometer 100 to Autobahn kilometer 102 for a straight 2000 meter takeoff run. Then they were delivered to the Luftwaffe. Building up the system was not without difficulty. First off, there was a severe lack of manpower at this stage. And this led to quite chaotic situations, especially as the Wehrmacht was aggressively conscripting key workers to which the German industry and the air ministry was very slow to respond. The Luftwaffe was already at this point the main branch to use forced labor in production, with estimates of the time approaching a figure of roughly 40% of forced labor in Luftwaffe production. And this included also concentration camp victims who were put to work on the 262, for example, at the Kuno 2 forest plant. The main assembly of the 262 and its engines were initially not meant to include concentration camp workers due to the sensitive tech, but this changed as the situation for Germany became ever more difficult. Production was also difficult because the ME262 had been designed already in the 1930s, when no requirement to save precious resources existed. As such, it was more expensive in resources than was good for Germany in 44. Likewise, the tooling and jig construction of the ME262 was severely impaired at the time, leading to a difficult and bottlenecked assembly of the aircraft. Also, regular power cuts caused delays in the production, while Allied bombing and interdiction destroyed much of the infrastructure used for the transportation of parts. And then finally, the Allies also identified and attacked the construction sites of this decentralized network. Also, to give you a brief idea of the costs of the ME262, it took about 9,000 man hours to complete one plane. And the Heinke 162, as a comparison here, only took 1,500 hours. The ME262 also cost 150,000 Reichsmark, which was double the cost of the Heinke 162. Of course, if you ever have a chance to look at the 262 or Heinke 162 in a museum, you will also see the reason why there is such a stark difference in man hours and costs, because the 162 really is kept in place with a couple of bolts. I think this serves as a good example of how complex and difficult decentralized production actually is. Yes, on the one hand, of course, it does decrease the value of individual nodes within the production network. However, it does require extensive investments and really a working infrastructure to have a chance of delivering a comparable number of airframes that are completed uh, compared to a centralized production line. So now let's talk about production figures. Although, since you appear to be interested in the ME262 and aircraft, do check out our partnership with Mortens, where you can get 10% off with my exclusive codes on all orders. Now, I actually got this one, uh, Messerschmitt ME262, Development and Politics by Dan Sharp. And uh, there's also a book by the same author here on the Heinkel HE 162. And for some reason, they put a paper two engine variant on the cover. And under normal circumstances, I'm gonna say, that is going to raise alarm bells for me. But this is actually a very solid booklet. And then again, of course, they also have this tome, The Secret Horsepower Race by Callum Douglas, who has been on the channel many times before. And they're all solid book choices. Check it out. Morton's has also extended my code to 2024, so make sure that you save it for future purchases as well. And also as a reminder here, you can also get a 10% discount with AK Interactive. If you are a hands-on person doing modeling, for example, or like reference books for aircraft, check out my discount that uh, applies to all of their products. Make sure to do that before the end of the year as the discount is set to end then. Uh, maybe it's gonna be extended, we'll, we'll see. But they do have a great selection that is a dream come true for any model builder. So deck yourself in for those very long and cold winter weeks. And also make sure to send me pictures on Twitter or on Instagram of your model building exploits. I'm not very good at it myself, I have to admit. I do like doing it, but I really, really like seeing completed models as well. So send those my way. 
Okay, so back to production. There remains some speculation regarding the final production figures of the Messerschmitt ME262. But overall, we have enough data to show off the main numbers. As my previous video has shown, German jet production ramped up quickly as an all-out effort was launched. The number of completed aircraft is generally stated at 1,433. Although for the record, I do have at least one source that I found at the German military archives during one of my research visits that states a lower total of 1,293 aircraft. Looking at both these figures, I believe that this may be because the file that I have found either does not include the repaired airframes or more likely does not include the figures for April 1945, which it doesn't, and all the figures from the final assembly at Obertraubing in Neuenburg do not seem to be included in every single month. You can see that in September 1944, the production ramps up to about 100 a month, and then it hits a relatively consistent output in early 1945, with a high of just under 300 aircraft in February. Production stops on the 19th of April 1945. It is generally assumed that about 6,000 Jumo engines pr produced around this time as well. On paper, this would mean that Germany was able to build four Jumo O4 engines per airframe, though the Jumo engine was also used in other aircrafts and had some severe quality problems as well. There is also some discrepancy regarding the figures of operational ME262. This is a figure that is not exactly known due to the effect of poor quality control and the problems with getting the planes into the hands of the Luftwaffe and of course the Allied raids. For example, in one book by Radinger, it states that about 500 machines were lost to Allied attacks, while Borg states that in 1944, only about 75% of the delivered ME-262s were accepted by the Luftwaffe, and this would be, at least for that year, 422 aircraft. On top of that, Gifford states that in total only about 350 fighters became operational in the end. Now these figures are somewhat different, but they can exist in parallel as they do not address the very same thing. But it does show us from a modern perspective how difficult the situation we have here to piece all the puzzle pieces together and understand how many of these aircraft were actually used by the Luftwaffe in operational sorties. Let's now make a final assessment of the Messerschmitt ME262 production and the impact this had. Germany was able to produce a considerable number of engines and airframes under austere conditions. One of the problems was the difficulty in building up a decentralized network given the limitations that Germany had at this time. This included problems with manpower, resources and the infrastructure, which are basically the three main elements that constitute such a network. However, converting completed aircraft into combat mass was also fraught with difficulty as only a limited number of ME262s became operational. There were also issues with getting enough skilled pilots to fly them, though less so than with other aircraft. When operational, the ME262 did present a tactical threat to Allied bombers when properly employed. That said, the Allies did quickly respond on the tactical level by identifying, patrolling above and attacking German positions with offensive fighter sweeps, and that effectively disrupted both the production as well as the operation of the 262. And as such, Germany's attempt to change the strategic picture through tactics and technology failed. In the end, the ME262 was not able to fulfill its central aim. And that was, on the operational level, to force the Allies to abandon daytime bombing and interdiction, thus, of course, reducing the pressure on Germany as well as the German Heer, the army, and on the strategic level, reverse the balance in the air domain by providing Germany with control of the air, at least over the Reich. However, the decentralization of the production line did in the end allow the ME262 to become operational in some numbers. If you're interested in this subject, I encourage you to check out these videos that are already uploaded on my channel. You can find all of them in the description. If you're a practically minded person, do check out the videos in the Inside the Cockpit series of the ME262 and the Heinkel 162. And if you're more into the history of these birds, go with the other ones that are shown here. Big thank you here to all the patrons and channel members for supporting this content, as well as Andrew and Bernard Kast from Military History Visualized for their fire support on this video. Make sure to check out the discount codes with Mortens and AK if you want to deck yourself in with some fantastic aviation goodness. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.